couple weeks ago, I saw a an interview kind of conversation between Trevor Noah, who I imagine that all of you know, and if you don't, you should, and Simon Sinek, who I imagine many of you know, and not all of you know. Simon Sinek uh, is like a, a leadership coach and he works in organizations. He's considered a thought leader uh, in organizations. And his, his uh, TED talk on um, the power of why, why are we doing what we're doing, uh, has had over 60 million viewings. I imagine that some people have seen it more than once, but that's a lot of viewings. And so they're sitting there on the stage and Trevor Noah, who apparently has known Simon Sinek for some time, says to him, says, you know, Simon, I'm always curious about what you're thinking about. What's what's on your leading edge? You know, I've been following you. I'm interested in your your thought processes. What are you thinking about these days? To which he responded, I've been thinking a lot about friendship. Um, okay, cool, interesting. I, I was surprised, you know, hearing that. And then he said something I found quite useful in terms of even a way of uh, using language. He said, people don't realize often the power of their friendship net worth. They don't realize the power and the importance, really, of their friendship net worth. And I thought, yeah, that's, that's cool. And people think about their self-worth and think about their money, you know, worth and all kinds of things. But what about friendships? And I thought this it makes sense to me because frankly, right now in this country and probably in the rest of the world, we are in crisis. I'm telling, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. But there is massive crisis happening. And I, I do like to look at crisis as the meaning of meaning both danger in the Chinese language, danger plus opportunity. And I do think that the big opportunity is coming through our ability to connect meaningfully with each other. I mean, for me, that's really at the core of my own life connection. And so I was thinking about really in the last year, the Surgeon General of the U.S. has come out and said, we're, we're in a crisis of connection. We are, we are absolutely in crisis. And what are we doing with that? What are we going to do? What are each of us doing to connect? All right. And so I've, I've looked at how, <clears throat> what do we, what do we pay attention to, you know, as people? You know, what is valued in the culture? And as somebody who is a licensed therapist and have been for many years and, and also a leadership coach and I work in organizations, I, I'm kind of fascinated by looking at what we do in terms of addressing issues, dynamics, difficulties on a, on a larger level. And so when you look at therapy, therapy is individual therapy, couples therapy, family group in organizations, leadership coaching, team development. Where is the friendship? Where is friendship in that? Now, you might form some friendships from groups, but even some therapeutic groups don't allow people to even connect with each other outside of the group. That's a whole nother matter. But I just think it's amazing when you think about how many people have challenges and friendships. I would venture to say that there's not one person sitting here tonight that hasn't had some difficulties, often profound difficulties in friendships. You've had friendships that you're really close with at some point and something happened and there's a disconnection and you didn't know how <clears throat> to reconnect. You may have tried or the other person tried with you, but very few of us, very few of us, have grown up really learning about how to be in relationship. I mean, to me, it's completely nuts. Like when we look at our education, we're, we're focused on so many skills, you know, reading, writing, arithmetic, 
you know, language, all kinds of things, which I'm not doubting the importance, but so little about actually how to be in relationship and how to even know ourselves. And that's what I want to talk with you about tonight, because I really, I really, really believe that we need, we need to invest in our friendships. Now, I, I have invested a lot in friendships, and I, uh, I'm guessing all of you know Rick in some way. Rick has been one of my very, very, very closest friends for over 35 years at this point. And so we know each other quite well, and I would venture to say I'm a pretty good confidant for him, and he's been an amazing ally for me. You know, and I, I, there's part of me that's actually really uh, feels a sweetness and thinking about him right now, because I know that all of you are here to some degree because of him. You know of him, you know of his work. And I, um, I can say that as a very close personal friend, Rick walks his talk. You know, I, I actually feel even a little teary, you know, here and thinking about because I, I, he lives in here in me. I know I'm not the only one, but he's he's worked hard on himself and he shows up and, and so I, I i sometimes think that people who don't know somebody who's considered kind of a teacher out there a luminary think well oh, person yeah, what's a person really like well he's a real deal I'll, I'll say that that's not primarily what this talk is about tonight but it just it just emerged from me so i'm just going to say it um but so in i i've invested in that friendship quite a lot and he's invested and you need to invest. I think a lot of times people think that kind of friendship is just something that happens. You know, it should just happen and you shouldn't give it much thought or much energy. It should just be so natural that you don't actually have to do anything with it. And that is complete and utter nonsense. You must work at it. You must practice. You know, I, I'm a strong believer in the power of practice and really any skill, mind, body skill that any of us ever want to develop, we have to practice. You know, I, I, I've joked with a couple of guys at my local gym and said, what, you're back again? It didn't work the last time? You know, and, and to kind of like laugh and go, because of course you have to keep doing it, even if it doesn't feel good. And I can say certainly in friendships, it doesn't always feel good. I mean, I can say like that so many times with I felt out of sorts with friends and the, the difficulties emerge. I haven't felt seen or loved or respected or something has come up. And I can say that the willingness to invest and to talk about what might be getting in the way is really the pathway into deeper connection. And, you know, the reality is it doesn't always work. You know, I've had friends who were friends for in the past or not friends anymore. New people come into my life. It can be fairly fluid, but you definitely want your people. And that's part of what I want to do is really encourage you tonight to go for it and not let fear and anxiety and doubt get in the way of connecting. A friendship you know, it's basically really how do we form a loving, affectionate companionship or condition in which we're mutually supportive, you know, in a caring relationship. Deep friendship can provide encouragement, inspiration, connection, and feedback. Feedback is really important because none of us can see ourselves completely as we are. I mean, it's, it's hard to even say exactly how, who are we, you know, in totality, the totality of who we are. It can be very confusing. Getting reflections back from people you trust. Oh, I didn't see that in myself. Oh, that sarcastic comment didn't land too well, did it? Oh, that hurt. Okay, sorry. Oh, what was going on in me that I did that? Oh, maybe I felt hurt by something, so I kind of flung something out there. All of these, the relationship is a way of, of constantly being attuned to oneself and other people. And, you know, we make mistakes. I mean, we're human. 
It ain't, this is not about perfection out here on this planet from what I've noticed. Maybe by tomorrow, but I'm a little dubious about that. Now, friendship underlies all community, you know, giving and sacrifice. And you think about it in Buddhism. Now, I imagine most, if not all of you, know about the three jewels or the three refuges. The Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. The Sangha is, is essential, you know, for pursuing the Dharma. That's what this community is about. And I recognize that it's online. And so it's not quite like you're in each other's physical presence, but there's still great opportunities to connect. And I, and with that, I want to point to George's group that meets after this. I know that George usually has a number of people who show up. Most people don't, and there's no judgment about not showing up for that. But at the same time, or and at the same time, there's an invitation because in that group, when you get into smaller groups, you actually have more of an opportunity to connect with other people. So I want, I want to encourage you to participate in that. And if, and if it's not this, to let yourself participate. And I know that sometimes it's very hard to do so, but it's, it's the only, sometimes it's the only show in town, at least in my mind. Now, this is, there's a pretty famous story, which I imagine many of you know, about Ananda, who was a disciple of the Buddha, who said to him that spiritual friendship, i.e. Sangha, is half of the holy life. And to this, the Buddha is said to have responded, do not say so, Ananda. Having a spiritual friendship is the whole of the holy life. As the story goes, Buddha was approaching his, as Buddha was approaching his death, he told his disciples to fear not, because there are you know, some of them were afraid that the teachings of Buddha would die when he died, his physical body died. To fear not, to focus on the importance of Sangha as the living embodiment of the Dharma. You know, and that's how we keep each other sane because we're all a little nuts. I mean, let's face it. I mean, I know none of you like to think of yourself as nuts. And I don't mean as a psychological condition nuts. I mean as a human condition because it's, it's so easy to go off and having friends to keep pulling you back, come back, come back. And you see other people, you know, who are going off in some way and your encouragement, your feedback, your love, your compassion can be the difference that for some people can literally spell the difference between life and death. Now, most of us are not quite on that edge, but many of us are. And so being open to others, being open in relationship and really allowing your heart to be open, allowing your heart to break. And I'm not saying go, go you forth and like try to have your heart broken, but I can certainly say that if your heart's never broken, you really have been playing it safe. And I would venture to say too safe. Friendships help us you know, weather the inevitable storms in life and enjoy the gifts that life has to offer. And the reality is we are wired to connect. I mean, there's been research in brain science. I'm imagining that Rick has spoken about this over time, that we all have a social brain that's monitoring really where we are in relation with other people. A lot of what our functions are about is to find our way to be valuable and to be seen as valuable and enjoy and enjoy and, and love within our tribe. Right? Because we really need each other. And in terms of this crisis of connection I was speaking about before, well, guess what? You know, there have to be some risks. If you're going to have the rewards of, of being in deep connections, you have to take risks. You know, and, and part of that is really valuing your relationships. I mean, so often I see people kind of walk away like I was hurt by that. I didn't like that, you know, and, and like, and I said, well, are you going to talk about it? And I can tell you that having worked at this point with thousands of people over the years, it's the jury's out. You know, in terms of people's general willingness 
to challenge the status quo. And generally speaking, it's kind of like this way of going, I don't know, I don't know how to do it, I feel awkward, I'm not sure how the other person's gonna respond. I have all kinds of doubts and all kinds of reasons to not show up. And I can say as someone who has been on this path, you know, of friendship and relationship for a long time, that I have blundered so many times, it's not even funny. But I have dusted myself off and gotten up and willing to have the difficult conversations. You know, and you need to be willing to do that. And you know what the reality is? It's not always the difficulties. I think a lot of times people really withhold their love, withhold their appreciation, and withhold their caring. They don't say it, how much they love someone, how much they care. I think it's particularly true with guys, you know, but that's, I'm not going to go into my gender rap tonight, which I can do quite easily, but there is a call for more openness. Now, given the risks, why would you do that, right? I mean, I'm imagining you've all heard the term social anxiety, and there are many of us on our venture say most people at some time in your life have thought about going to a social occasion and felt really anxious about it, and then have judged yourself for feeling anxious. What's wrong with me? It's just a party, or it's just a gathering, it's just a this, or it's just a that. But the reality is that the same system that <clears throat> exists for physical danger in the brain is the same for social danger. And so, when we are feeling anxious socially, is it really it triggers survival issues? And you think about it and go, like, why? Why would that be? Well, we are tribal beings, and if you screw up in the tribe, what's the worst that can happen? Well, you get tossed out of the tribe. Then what? No one survives alone. Not not in the wilderness. Not in those times. So we're, we're linked on some level to feel massive levels of anxiety when we feel threatened socially, which is why, in part, it's important to practice. Practice your breathing, practice your self-compassion. I highly recommend mindful self-compassion for those of you who have not taken the course. I think it's very important to continually be kind to yourself. I, I am a recovering, relentless self-critic. I'm not saying I don't go there anymore because I'm, again, not a believer in perfection, but the person who was somehow living in here and the person who is living in here is so different in part because I've taken a lot of risks and I've survived those risks. And I, I, there were times when I, when I doubted that. Now, and the reality is it's, it's, on one level, easier to avoid interactions. I mean, it's difficult, right? It's like being around other people, connecting with other people, being more open. It can, you know, trigger this anxiety. And many of us, we just want to avoid that. And that's natural. And it's perfectly fine to avoid a time. So I'm not saying that you should always go after everything and every person at every time and every, I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying, I am saying that if you, always avoid, you continually make your world smaller and smaller and smaller. And I don't think any of us really want to live in such a small, tight world. Now, what exactly are we revealing? Right? I think about the word intimacy. And oftentimes, that word seems to be synonymous in many people's mind with sex and sexuality. I was intimate with that person. I don't see it that way at all. I think that a person can be intimate without being sexual and they can be sexual without being intimate. Now, I've, obviously, when it comes to, to, to the land of lovemaking, it's better to be both, right? This isn't a talk about sex, by the way. But I think about the word intimacy as the phonetic of into me see, allowing other people to see into you. Now, that can be pretty terrifying. And I know that for, for me, when I was much younger, 
I was on the verge, and I would say that my first therapist would agree, I was on the verge of a nervous breakdown. I was 20 years old, living in Boston. I wanted to drop out of college. I was convinced to go to therapy instead, which I did. And I remember sitting there with my therapist, which is now over 50 years ago, and telling him how anxious I was around being around people and that I really didn't know where I, where I ended and other people began. I'm slowly learning that. You know, so I, I, as I've mentioned, I screwed up many times in relationship, but I, I just had this intense drive to connect. It's not always because I can be actually quite introverted and I don't want to be around people. I think for kind of more natural reasons, but I like being alone, you know, at times. And I'm sure that many of you like being alone and that's perfectly fine. This isn't about always being with people or always doing that. It's about challenging yourself at least just a little bit more. You know, and really think about how important is it for you to connect with other people? You know, so to really be on your own interpersonal journey, I think is like a super important part of life. It's part of what Sangha is about. It's part of what life is about. And again, all of us, I would venture to say, but I'll, I'll be, uh, I'll take the more moderate path. And I would say the vast majority of you have, including me, have been seriously wounded in relationships, wounded in our families of origin, wounded in friendships, wounded at work, wounded, and then wind up licking our wounds, but not talking about that or just kind of cloistering around. And I don't think that's the, 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 the only place to heal. Now, obviously, it does help to practice. You know, to do your meditation, to do, to practice self-compassion. It helps. It absolutely helps. And there's also the interpersonal practice of really about showing up in relationships by say, saying that there's an ouch. Now, I don't know about you. I know, but I know myself pretty well. And I would say that if I'm hurt by something a friend has done or not done, I'm not really good at keeping my heart open unless I talk about it. That's me. Now, some people may well be better at that. And some people are better at keeping their hearts open, even when they have felt wounded in some way. I, that's not me. You know, so it's, I think it's important to know who you are, you know, what your, what your personal wiring is about, because that's going to help you make decisions about what you're willing to do, you know, in relationships with others. Now, I'd like to, to really, you know, suggest that we all need to some degree more courage. You know, I, uh, I was asked some about the course that Rick and I created called the courage to connect. And a lot of that really is about having courage. And what is courage? Well, I'd like to read a little passage from you about courage by the poet David White, who I'm sure many of you know of. Courage is a word that tempts us to think outwardly, to run bravely against opposing fire, to do some, something under besieging circumstance, and perhaps, above all, to be seen to do it in public, to show courage, to be celebrated in story, rewarded with medals, given the accolade, but a look at its linguistic origins is to look in a more interior direction and toward its original template, the old Norman French. Courage is the measure of a heart, which means heart. Courage is the measure of a heartfelt participation with life, with another, with a community, a work, a future. To be courageous is not necessarily to go anywhere or do anything except to make conscious those things we already feel deeply and then to live through the unending vulnerabilities of those consequences. And I want to pause here for a moment and say that vulnerability is part of life. Vulnerability 
is on some level, the meaning of it is openness to attack. And you think to yourself, why would I want to be vulnerable with somebody if it makes me open to attack, right? You know, on some level, it doesn't make intuitive sense. But the, back, but the bottom line is, if you're not showing certain vulnerabilities, if you're not trusting another to see those, it's hard to have intimacy of intimacy because you need to allow the other person to see into those, which obviously involves risk. He goes on, to be courageous is to seat our feelings deeply in the body and in the world, to live up to and into the necessities of relationships that often already exist with things we find we already care deeply about with a person, a future, a possibility in society or with an unknown that begs us on always has begged us on to be courageous is to stay close to the way we are made. Developing friendships, having the courage to do so. I'm sure that all of you have people in your life that you may like to be closer with, or maybe some people you want to be less, more distant from. Sometimes it's time, it's important to end relationships or to change relationships. So it's not always moving in the direction of greater connectedness. It's really what feels right to you. You know, and I, I find that uh, friendships are things you can develop throughout life. I know that a lot of times people think, well, you know, I'm, a, I'm an adult, I'm here, I can't develop friendships. Uh, not true. Right? I was talking with a, a colleague of mine recently, and he said something that I found kind of interesting and, I, and true in many ways, which he said, when you're four years old, having a friend, all you mean is you can be crayon and coloring next to each other. When you're adults and developing new friendships, best to do a project together, get involved with something. And that's what I find, you know, just getting involved <clears throat> for me with the different projects I'm involved with. It's like, that's where connections can really happen. You know, so I think that it's really important to think about not only your kind of individual, you know, meeting someone like maybe I'll meet someone in a coffee shop or something, which can be a little more challenging certainly possible, but also thinking about where are your interests, where are your values, and to engage yourself with other people and groups that share certain values with you. So I'm going to, I'm going to pause uh, for a moment here, and I, I think I've shared a bunch of different things about friendships. I want to invite some of you to share anything yourself to ask any question. I am going to ask that you don't go on and on. Don't, no long stories. Right now we have about 15 plus minutes left. So we want to keep it, you know, it's you know, relatively short. But I want to open it up now for anyone who has any questions or, or is touched by something or wants to explore some, something around friendship. So if you will, if you would like to uh, speak, Please raise your virtual hand and George will, you'll come to the front and we will call on you. So the floor is open for you. So we have Anna. Anna, you look like a bird. I do, don't I? Okay, hang yeah. on. I do exist in human form, hang on. I suspected. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Gosh, I feel, feel so seen now. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, so um, you know, I come from a lot of relational trauma, I understand. <clears throat> and I'm looking at you know, interpersonal effectiveness in my recovery process. And I find that setting boundaries like I'm doing now and just figuring out what's true for me, like it's almost like negotiating boundaries in the beginning of a friendship. It's like there's part of me that interested and curious but another part that's afraid and especially you know from a what can I trust point of view <laughs> so I'm taking things slowly but how to set you know just 
working on setting those boundaries and doing like the mindfulness is helping me um, be aware, like, Ooh, does my body not feel safe, but it, and it still feels awkward. Like, Ooh, I'm open, but am I really like, I'm not sure where my boundary is. So I just wanted to share that. So was there, thank you for that. Was there, was there any question in this or you just wanted to share? Was it perfectly fine just to share that? Um, I'm sure like maybe if there's a question that can come out of that would be great. I don't have it very well articulated. But I do, th I do think what you were raising is very important. And I did not speak about boundaries uh, this evening. But boundaries are incredibly important. Like when I was uh, sharing about my first, but not my last, my first therapeutic experience as a client, you know, what I was talking about in terms of where do I end and other people begin, there's a boundary, you know, in between there, right? Yeah. And, and I, I look at oneself and relationships kind of like a, a, what's a healthy cell? Like what's a healthy cell wall? Well, it turns out that a healthy cell wall is permeable i.e. nutrients can flow in and out, but it's not too permeable. Because if, it, if it's too permeable, it doesn't have any boundary in and of itself. And so when you think about relationships, think about yourself as like, how can I be permeable, which is another way of saying really open, but also not losing my balance, not being pulled out of the fact that I still am in the midst of our deeper connectedness, I still am an individual human being. So thank you for that, Anna. All right. Helpful. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Is it Kalium? Am I pronouncing it correctly? Uh, it's Haliyun. The K is <laughs> silent. Not even close. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I guess I don't have a question, but um, I thought it was, I just wanted to share something, which is like a fact, um, I guess my experience. Um, I'm a therapist and I uh, had um, two people reach out to me for friendship therapy. And it was a very wonderful experience to help facilitate these two people an environment to kind of work on their relationship their friendship and that was such a new experience for me as a therapist and I just want to say you know it's 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 coming up you know it's coming up in you know in our world it's, and so people are reach, uh, searching for friendship therapy and so I, I think it's kind of helpful and important right like as you were sharing that's great yeah. I love hearing stories like that. Okay. That that was it. <laughs> thank well, you. Thank you. I, I appreciate hearing that. And you know, some some of you therapists I may think I'm gonna I'm gonna even market myself as a friendship therapist. And I thought of because people go, Oh wow, that's kind of a cool idea because most people just don't think about even that option. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I think like you said, they just tend to give up or you know, or yeah. Yeah, you can get it. Yeah. Cool. Great. Well, thank you very much. All right. So, Thomas. Oh, uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Can you hear you? Can't see you. Yeah, you can't see me. My video, my computer, something's happening. Okay. And I apologize. We can hear you most importantly. So. Yeah, I apologize for that. Hello. I just wanted to say that uh, uh, first of all, thank you for hitting on a topic. Um, that is really, for me, uh, life affirming, hmm. you know, how to create community and friendships and how to pay attention to it, uh, and how easy it is to ignore it, you know, to not pay attention. And so this talk tonight, your talk tonight, has um, encouraged me, excited me to think about specific ways that I can do that with 
friends or part friends that I have ignored, that I have not put the energy into affirming, you know, their, their interest in community, their interest in friendship. So uh, that's what tonight has done for me. That's what you have done for me uh, is to provoke, provoke and energize my thinking on, you know, how I can do that. And I thank you for that, Daniel. Oh, thank you, Thomas. I'm, I'm, I mean, for me, the greatest gift is when people actually connect. And if I can be uh, helpful in that, I mean, that's, um, it brings tears to my eyes. So I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm glad, I'm glad to hear that. And I, and I think that you can be a role model for others in that because I'm pretty confident that a lot of you folks out here that have people in your life that you've thought about, you know, reach out and they're not reaching out to me. So I'm not going to reach out to them because they're not reaching out to me. You right. first, you first, that kind of you first mentality. And the problem is, that there are a lot of people, and I venture to say well over half people who are you first people. And then when they're in you first with relation with other you first people, there's, that's it. The connection will wither on the spine. Absolutely. There needs to, there needs to be some action. And, and it's, it can be awkward. There's no question about it. And I can say that even as somebody who's pretty skilled, you know, in relationship with a being unduly humble, you know, or not humble or arrogant there, like, I still feel anxious in even close friendships at times. You know, I still feel vulnerable, like, what do I say now? Or it's just like, I have anxiety come up in my body, despite 10, 20, 30 years of friendship that, and I can't even explain why at times, it just kind of comes up around the closeness, you know, there. And so I think it's important to really normalize anxiety and not use anxiety as, as a reason to stop or to disappear. But that's part of the challenge is it's giving us these physiological uh, messages, go away, you know, leave the scene. But it turns out that leaving the scene will really deprive you of certain nutrients. It's a, it's a problem. So you have to not always listen to that anxiety and push into it. All right, thank you, Thomas. Sure, thank you, Daniel. You got it. And Farah, is that your name? Is that, did I pronounce it correctly? You're right to the spot, hi. All right. Thank you for the talk. It's really uh, hit to the heart for me. Uh, I'm also the therapist and uh, I came along so well, uh, I believe that uh, from become too shy, now I'm very comfortable. I easily make a friend, but I'm not staying too long in that friendship. And what I noticed is uh, most of my issue is about, as you mentioned in a beautiful way, the word of intimacy. I'm great of listening to other people, helping other people, be there for other people, but I have a hard time allowing other people see me through it. Mm. So I'm not sharing much. I'm more willing, I'm just sharing and I'm smart enough to know how much I can share for them to open. And I'm then I'll, I will be fully there, right? But I think the, uh, the lack in me is just intimacy, which means allowing other people to see me. Well, I see that uh, lack in me, but at the same time, it comes to mindfulness and loving kindness and accepting yourself just the way you are, right? So I don't know if I'm using that to cover that, my anxiety to be seen, or I am uh, really accepting and that's okay too, you know? So I wanna hear your voice. I think you're avoiding. 
<laughs> you asked, you know, <clears throat> because it's, I mean, to some degree, it's, it's a bit of a therapist syndrome. You know, there are there are a lot of therapists who, frankly, as good as they are, can hide behind being a therapist. You know, because it it it's riskier and more vulnerable more vulnerable to reveal your own issues than it is necessary to hear other people's. Now that may not be true for everyone, but for most people, it's harder to reveal than it is to hear. And you know, if you want to really be a scientist about this practice, you know, do something different. Uh, I, I, I somehow keep the, the words of Michelle, Michelle Obama keep ringing in my ears for in variety. Of, do something. If any of you have heard, heard her, just do something, you know, and, and so I just I think about that in terms of what is the What's the undeveloped aspect of this? I'm not just talking. I'm not talking about you in particular, Farrow. I think about this in general. What's undeveloped? Well, I'm really good at here, 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 and here. But here, I don't do this, and I just okay. I'm just going to practice my mindfulness. Not that that isn't important. I think that is important. So I'm not. I'm in no way dissuading from that. But there's also you really come to know yourself better through self-disclosure, not necessarily receiving the disclosures of other people. Some of the original research by Sidney Gerard in, in self-disclosures that said, really, that's how people come to know themselves. And I can tell you that my own experience is in revealing myself and having the willingness to talk about my difficulties, my doubts, my insecurities, my jealousies, my, you know, the, the stuff that most people don't want to talk about. I, not that I wanted to talk about, but I knew that I had to talk about it in order to get more connected. And so my hope for you is that you'll take some risks and just see what happens, inclusive of telling the whole story. Like, hey, I'm not used to doing this. I'm used to receiving other people. I'm really good at that. I, I believe you are, you know, and I'm going to I'm going to experiment and try and show more about myself and see what happens. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think we have time for one more person who is Laura. Thank you. I appreciate this. You know, friendship is the one thing that I pine for as much as I have. I love so many things in my life and I really have reinvented my life. I left a 30 year marriage three years ago. Um, I moved, I left my home, I left my community. I started over in most ways, except my work and my core group of friends. But you know what I find, and I'm involved in a lot of things, but I find that I get a sense that peop a lot of people don't really want to make new friends. They have their little groups, they have their buddies that they do certain things with. And very rarely, it seems like people in my, that where I live are very friendly and everything. And I've had a tiny bit of that now where I've had people invite or include, but, but I, you know, so many times I get that, I, I get that feeling that it's really hard to break in as a new person, you know, an older person into people that have been established in their friendships and in their, in their um, systems. So are you talking with people there about that you'd like to be included more? I, I mean, I don't exactly know, you know, I, I join, you know, I'm participating in a lot of things. I'm always out there. I've met a lot of people since I got myself a dog. Um, <laughs> and I, you know, I've joined a church. I've joined a couple of book clubs. I've a volunteer, um, you know, I, I'm a teacher, so I work at a college. And so I'm pretty much, you know, on my own, I have a couple of friends, but I, you know, I mean, it's sort of a, sort of a isolated kind of job in many ways. Um, I love my students, um, but, you know, I, it's, it's the one thing that I struggle with. And I know that I do have a lot of wounds, a lot of history of rejection and underlying it. I think that sometimes I just don't think I'm good enough in a lot of ways. And I do find myself, you know, backing off sometimes, but I, you know, 
I, I really desire, but I don't, you know, I, I really get that sense from a lot of people that, you know, they have their little groups and they do their things, but most very often they're comfortable there. Well, I'm an outlier. And I, I, I know I am, and I've been told that many times, but I mean, I would talk about it was if there are people in, in your community there that you find interesting and want to connect with more, sometimes you just have to do something, you know, in a different kind of way and take more of a risk. You know, and I, you know, I appreciate your vulnerability in the saying about your self-concept there that, you know, you're not uh, always enamored with yourself. Shall we, shall we say, and you're not alone in that. I mean, I, everyone's got wounds to their self-concept, but nonetheless, sometimes it's the only show in town. And if you want something, you have to go for it. You know, and I, I remember when my son was four, which was a long time ago, he had this song, there's a line in it. It said, if you want something, you have to ask for it. <laughs> and I thought to myself, and I thought about this many times since then. I thought, how many people really ask? You know, really ask in a sincere way. I know, yeah. But I, I don't know. I just have made that observation, you know, um, that there's a lot of people who have their established little groups and they too don't really want to. You, you've got a lot of assumptions about what they, what they want and what they're willing to do. You may be right. I'm not, I don't know. I'm not. I'm not saying you're wrong at all. But right. I, I like to move beyond assumptions, you know, because we all go into our assumption warehouse. Right. I call it, and we assume we understand, and often don't. And so right. sometimes it's just the willingness to take an interpersonal risk.